My name is Norma Field, and I teach in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you this morning, um, and thank you so much for coming out on a, on a precious Saturday in May. Um, I hope that it will be, indeed, a day that you will remember as a meaningful one for all of you. It's a day, I think of it as a day for exploration and reflection at a very sober turning point in our history, and by our, I mean in the broadest terms of all of us, the human species, not to mention other living creatures. When we started planning the symposium over a year ago, uh, we titled it The Atomic Age from Hiroshima to the Present. We had no idea, of course, uh, to th imagine that the present was going to include a place name called Fukushima. I think it's most appropriate that we're able to host this symposium at the University of Chicago, which is both the birthplace of nuclear energy and almost simultaneously profound, sustained concerns, even anguish about it by those who um, made, created it, created, formed, made its operations palpable. From the earliest stages of atomic research, it was imagined to be a dream source of energy for humankind, a dream that was quickly overtaken by the war effort against Nazi Germany. As most of you probably know, in 1942 on this campus, the first sustained nuclear chain reaction took place. Um, it was, it's primarily the work of, of the Leo uh, Szilard and Enrico Fermi. Szilard, of course, becomes, uh, is remembered for his uh, quite urgent efforts to try to stop the actual dropping of the bombs, his actual application on the people of Japan. But he's certainly not the only one. There are many others. Uh, we also remember the world, many people in the world remember the Frank Report, um, the chair of a committee, very interestingly, notably called a Committee on Political and Social Problems, committee consisting primarily of physicists at the University of Chicago. Frank was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Um, he chaired the committee report. Um, which was uh, issued in June of 1945. It urged that the bombs not be dropped on the people of, of uh, Japan, but first be tested if it had to be done at all so that its lethal effects could be demonstrated. Frank had said uh, two months before the report was issued in a memorandum, quote, mankind has learned to unleash atomic power without being ethically and politically prepared to use it wisely. Uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is once again housed on campus happily, whose director will be one of our panelists today, from its inaugural issue, which is September of 1945, shows the marks of the concerns of physicists, the scientists who were directly involved with finding redemptive, peaceful uses of atomic energy. Um, so that is an ongoing concern, yet Atoms for Peace has existed in intimate relationship from the beginning with Atoms for War. Nuclear energy and nuclear weapons are two sides of the same coin of the splitting atom. In the ensuing decades, what we've seen is that the invisibility of radiation and its great potential danger have facilitated and necessitated secrecy as part of both weapons production, testing, and nuclear power plant operation. The potency, indeed the mind-boggling duration of some forms of radiation, have imposed upon us a sort of suspended cons consciousness about dire possibilities that are never meant to happen, whether in the game of mutually assured destruction or power plant explosions. I'm thinking that many people in this room may be comfortable opposing nuclear weapons or at least in supporting nuclear nonproliferation. Surely it is now time to join this discussion 
for the scrutiny of its twin, nuclear energy? Who controls this discussion as well as the technology? How are the benefits and risks distributed? When things go badly awry, a grim reality that continues to unfold as we speak in Fukushima and its environs, which includes the capital of Tokyo, who pays which consequences? What does expertise mean in the situation? What are the implications for democracy? Today, we're very fortunate to have two independent filmmakers who have brought their films to help us consider these questions. Uh, the first film we'll be screening, American Mom, is by M.T. Sylvia, who's a highly successful sound engineer and manager for Pixar Animation Studios. That's her day job. M.T., long a peace activist and anti, peace and anti-nuclear activist, was moved to take a journey back to the early years of the American nuclear era and forward to the present, a time span filled with the anguished reflections of her mother, who was an expert participant in that era. The making of the film itself represents an evolution in the mother-daughter relationship, undoing the tension of long-held secrecies in the course of pursuing the national secrets of the nuclear era. The film is currently being screened around the country. It's garnered five awards as of date. And next weekend, it's up for uh, Best Music for Documentary Film Awards. So we'll be looking for that news. Our second uh, film by filmmaker and also independent filmmaker Hitomi Kamanaka, who arrived from Japan on Sunday. She was in California and has come here since. Um, this film, Ashes to Honey, In Search of a Sustainable Future, is, is her third in a nuclear tri trilogy. Her journey began in Iraq in 1998, where she encountered the train of suffering, particularly on the part of children and adolescents, left by, the, uh, by depleted uranium following the Persian Gulf War. The film we'll see to today, Ashes to Honey, um, was being screened at the time the March 11th earthquake hit. After she realized uh, where the nuclear reactor catastrophe was unfolding, she suspended screening, a decision that puzzled some of us. But since rain was forecast in the capital area, she did not want people to be exposed to, to be exposing themselves to radiation in order to come watch her film which was contesting the dangers of radiation. So, she, so this very timely film, she voluntarily withdrew from screening for a period of time. The film was initially subject to, subjected to a virtual boycott by the mainstream media in Japan, long under suffocating pressure from the power industry. And it's important to note that there's a gap between the mainstream media um, in Japan and the internet. It's now being sought by an urgently awakened and often frantic citizenry. She's also sought out by journalists from the mainstream press in the guise of interviews, but what they really want to know from her is, is it true, should I really be getting my wife and kids out from Tokyo? To which she says, yes, take, get them out as soon as you can, as far as we can, as when we get off the phone. Um, she, this of course, this urgency, the success of her film is something she never wanted. On the contrary, she had, want, she had thought she was dedicating her efforts as have other activists, including nuclear scientists, particularly at Kyoto University, to prevent such a response. I cannot count how many times I have heard from her since I picked her up at O'Hare on Wednesday evening. I thought we had more time. And the first time I heard it, when she asked that I roll down the windows of the car, because it was so refreshing for her to be able to feel fresh air through open windows, which she no longer does at her home in Tokyo. We're fortunate also to have panelists to help us reflect on these films from their long-term commitments and lived experience. Um, the moderators of each panel will introduce them, but you also have more about them on your sheets. The, whatever they share with us may well include strong differences 
which we welcome in the hope that they will clarify our thinking and prepare the way for further critical discussion. I want to thank my partners in organizing this symposium, uh, Yuki Miyamoto of DePaul University, Tomomi Yamaguchi from uh, Montana State University in Bozeman, Sarah Earhart of the Center for East Asian Studies, and Masaki Matsumoto, who's done our extraordinary website. And I urge you to visit it if you haven't. It's, an it's really a remarkable uh, compilation of all kinds of information in English and Japanese. I thank our sponsors, the Committee on Japanese Studies at the University of Chicago, the International House, um, the Gender Studies and Human Rights Programs, Rockefeller Chapel, and the Department of Anthropology. I also thank the Japanese Student Association, who will later be, who will be selling Downwinder t-shirts, and they are $10 in cash. Um, there is an ATM machine here that's available because we will only take cash and all of it will go for Japan Relief and Rebuild. Um, and while I'm giving that kind of information, bathrooms are down the, down, are right around the corner and down the, uh, down the stairs. And please turn your cell phones off and no recording. Um, there are index cards available. Please pick them up, write down questions for the filmmakers or any of the uh, participants. We'll collect them. There will be a box for that. In the back of the room, Sarah Earhart's holding it up. So that will be the box for your index cards and we will try to field as many as we can at the final round table. Um, we also invite, we will also be inviting you to come up to the mic, which is currently not here, but if you want that form, and to the extent time allows, please um, come and raise your questions in that form too. And, and the panel discussions and the round table, the questions and answers will all be taped. Um, we will, so please take this as my having um, told you and that you are acknowledging that you are being taped. Um, we will... Uh, try to incorporate this material in our website, which we plan to maintain, so please be visiting that. Before I left this morning, I, there were two, two items on my iGoogle Japanese homepage. One was the announcement that earlier in May, uh, researchers from Sandy and Los Alamos National Laboratories completed their second experiment, which they call SHOTS, the way atmospheric nuclear tests were called, um, to explore the properties of plutonium materials under extreme pressures and temperatures. The information is used to keep the U.S. nuclear stockpile safe, secure, and effective. At the same time this was happening, again announced today, that is to say 14 hours ago in Japan, at the same time earlier in May, TEPCO um, found that the, uh, a water leak from outside the storage pit, outside the number three reactor of Fukushima Daiichi resulted in about 100 times the annually permitted level of radioactive material following a much larger leak from the second reactor. So it is hardly under control, the situation there. This will be a long day, but I think, I hope a rare opportunity to consider together one of the most urgent issues facing humankind at the very moment of crisis in this, the year of the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl. So I welcome you to make yourselves as comfortable as you can, to get up and walk around and get water as you find necessary, and first and foremost, to absorb the two films into which our filmmakers have poured in so much of their lives. Thank you.